Hey everybody, Jeremy Markovich here. Two quick notes before we get going. First, this podcast has a new home. It's now part of the North Carolina Rabbit Hole, which you can find at ncrabbithole.com. There you can check out previous episodes of Away Message, you can find any new episodes that we're putting out, and if you like this podcast, I think, no guarantees, but I think you will like my weekly newsletter. It is about weird North Carolina stuff, comes out every Thursday, it is free if you want it to be, and you can sign up at ncrabbithole.com. Second, this episode was produced during my time at Our State Magazine. Now, I happen to think that most of it still holds up, but some of the promo codes and websites that I mention may no longer work. Okay, here's the show. How we doing, lady? Hi. Today, I am riding around a golf course in Greensboro with a guy named Jimmy Moore, who seems to know everybody. She can smoke it too. Oh, she popped that ball up. She got nervous. She usually hit it up there around the sand trap. <laughs> Jimmy works here. He washes carts, hangs out around the clubhouse, cracks jokes. Hey, we out of beer. We out of beer. We're out of beer? I'm out of beer. <laughs> Just messing with everybody. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's my job. I'm here talking with Jimmy because... I want to know about this thing that happened here at Gillespie Golf Course a long time ago. Something that a lot of people have forgotten about, but something that a lot of folks here at the course still remember. First, though, Jimmy has to tell me about the part of the course that he doesn't like. One of the holes that I hate is number seven. If you get up top of the the green, it's bad. And I call the top of the green hell, because if you that's where you at, you that's what you in. I'm sorry to say. Can you can you ride me out to number seven and we'll we'll take I, a look at it so I, I can see it in person? I take you anywhere you want to go on the golf course. All right. What's happening, little man? Hey. You doing all right? Doing good. Okay. Those guys over there are playing number seven, seven now. The hole that I hate. <laughs> we catch up with those guys. None of them seems to be having the round of his life. <laughs> I told you for the trees, dude. <laughs> Audio bite of click, click. Straight. See, that's why this game is great. You got four friends here, and they just ragging on each other, and, and they drink. They don't, what a beer at? What a beer? What a beer? Oh, that a beer. See? That is. If we was on the basketball court, you couldn't do that. <laughs> You've probably picked up on this by now, but Jimmy loves golf. And he's been coming to Gillespie for a long time. As a kid, he was a caddy here. It was a good job. It was fun. You learned something, you know. You, you got to talk to doctors and lawyers and people you caddy for, and they would give you some good advice sometimes about how to make it in the world. Jimmy carried a lot of golf bags back in the day, but out of all the people that Jimmy caddied for, one sticks out in his mind. A guy named Doc, short for Dr. George Simpkins. For one thing, unlike a lot of the golfers that came before him, Doc Simpkins was black, just like Jimmy. He always had something funny to say. You see him, he speak to you, young fella, uh, you know, might rub you on the head, ask you how you doing today. You you got a bag today? And you said no. He said, well, I'm going to get ready to play rare mine. And Simpkins was more than just a good golfer. How big was sports in your house growing up? Very big. Badminton, golf, tennis, uh, and he collected every trophy he won. He never threw out anything. So I think in our house we had like four or six trophy cases. This is Chris Simpkins, the son of George Simpkins. And there were trophies actually lining the, going up the stairs to the bedrooms. We ran out of room (laughs) in the trophy cases. He was excellent at tennis, but obsessed with golf. I can remember countless times of him taking me out to the course where we would never even play. We, he would, I would just sit there and watch him hit practice shot after practice shot. Uh, he would also practice in the living room, holding the club, swinging, practicing, trying to perfect his swing. But a very long time ago, George Simpkins did something at Gillespie Golf Course that transcended the sport and led to something much, much bigger. 
at what point did you realize the magnitude of what your your father had done? People would come up to me often as a young kid and say, you really should be proud of your father. You don't know what kind of man he is. You don't know how much of a difference he's made in my life. You don't know how he's helped this group of people. And then, uh, you know, occasionally we would get uh, telephone calls with uh, threats. Did you ever talk to Doc Simpkins about, you know, that, that incident? Did he, ever, did he ever bring it up? You ever talk to him about it? No, no, he never brought it up. Jimmy Moore says he was too little to remember the incident at Gillespie Golf Course when it happened. But he knows what happened next. And what happened next changed an entire city. It changed the course of Doc Simpkins' whole life. It all started with just a single round of golf. But it shows what happens when you know you're right and still lose anyway. And then, improbably, impossibly, win a bigger victory than you ever thought possible. From Our State Magazine, this is Away Message. I'm Jeremy Markovich. Well, I was born uh, in Greensboro at the house I live in now, August the 23rd, 1924. George Simpkins died in 2001. But a year before that, he sat for a very long interview to talk about his life. My father practiced dentistry here for 40 years. And... When the time came to choose a career, Simpkins went into the family business, dentistry. But every Wednesday, without fail, he'd close his office at noon, change out of his smock, grab his clubs, and go play golf. When Simpkins first started playing golf, there were not a lot of other black golfers in Greensboro because if you were black, there was only one place in town that you could play. We had a little segregated golf course called Noco Park Golf Course. We'd been trying to get the city to uh, fix it up and cut the, cut the grass and fix the greens and everything and keep it up, and they would never do it. There was another course not too far away called Gillespie Golf Course. So I grew up right across the street from the Gillespie Golf Course. Jim Melvin remembers doctors and lawyers and businessmen playing there. It was a very good golf course. Uh, there were a number of uh, amateur tournaments played on it. It was 18 holes, owned by the city of Greensboro, and it was segregated. And in the late 1940s, black people in Greensboro said, that is not fair. Our tax money is paying for that course, so we should be able to play it. But in 1949, instead of integrating the course, the city decided to do something else. They closed the golf course and uh, tried to reopen it as a semi-private, which was stupid. What that meant was the city still owned the land, but then leased it out to a private company. And that private company made what had been a public course into one that required a membership to play. And all the members just happened to be white. And then five years later in 1954 comes this huge decision from the United States Supreme Court, Brown versus Board of Education. That case said segregation in public schools and in effect all public places was unconstitutional. It is my opinion that the South will be law-abiding and will comply with the decision of the court and accept it. It was a landmark decision, but it didn't change things overnight. It would take years. This girl here was the first Negro, apparently, of high school age to show up at Central High School the day that the federal court ordered it integrated. This morning, The mob again gathered in front of the Central High School of Little Rock. Many of them shouting epithets at her. There will be no enforced integration in Virginia. Units of the National Guard have been and are now being mobilized. And I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. But Brown versus Board of Education proved that, for the civil rights movement, 
there was a way forward. Mrs. Rosa Parks was arrested because she refused to give up her seat for a white passenger. And in December of 1955, just a week after the arrest of Rosa Parks started the Montgomery bus boycott, the buses are empty because the Negro people aren't riding them. George Simpkins decided that maybe the time was right to see if he could go play the golf course that he'd always wanted to play. So one Wednesday afternoon, my half a day off, uh, six of us, including myself, decided to go out and see if we couldn't play at Gillespie. So we went out and uh, put our money on the counter and tried to sign the book. And when we were signing the book, the caretaker uh, snatched the book from us and said, no, you can't sign this book. You, you can't play here. So we said, well, we, we intend to play. And we put our money down. I think we put 75 cent down to play 18 holes. That was the fee then. And we proceeded to tee off on number one tee. The golf pro was at lunch, and when he comes back, he finds out what's going on and catches up with Simpkins and the rest of the men on the fifth hole. He came out and he started cursing us and going on and telling us that this was a private facility, and we said we know better. Soon after that, the police show up. Well, he cursed us and threatened us and called us everything under the sun, and so I told him, I said, well, we're out here for a cause. He said, what? damn cause. I said the cause of democracy. Simpkins and the men keep playing. The seventh hole, on to the eighth. The police and the pro kept following them. I had to keep a club in my hand for protection because I thought any minute that he would uh, hit me. They get to the ninth hole. I would try to hit the ball down the center and I was so nervous I was hitting it to the right and it was and I just couldn't enjoy myself at all. So after nine holes, I told the guys, I said, let's go. And uh, so we all left. And that night, the police came by the house and arrested all of us for playing, for trespassing out at Gillespie Park Golf Course. So all six men end up in Greensboro City Court. And the judge says, if you plead guilty, I'll go easy on the fine and we'll forget about it. I said, oh no, no, we're not gonna do that. We're not guilty and uh, we're gonna take this all the way to Supreme Court if necessary. The men are found guilty. They each get a $15 fine and then they start appealing. First to Superior Court where they faced an all white jury. And prosecutors tried to say that the men were arrested for trespassing, not because they were black, but because they weren't members. Two members of the jury we found out had played at Gillespie. Both of them were white men. So Simpkins' lawyer puts them on the stand. They testified that they were not members, nor were they the invited guests of any member. All they did was pay a fee and play out there. That testimony proved that in reality, if you were white, you didn't need a membership to play. And that shot down the prosecution's case. And so what happens? Simpkins and the other men are found guilty again. And so they appeal again. Now in the meantime, our lawyers go into federal court. They figure if we're not getting anywhere in the state courts, maybe the federal courts will help. And they're right. Judge Johnson J. Hayes said we had a right to, to play out there. We had a right to go out there. And the only reason they arrested us were because we were black. The judge says, OK, a private company runs the course, but the city of Greensboro owns the land. And that makes the course a public facility which means it needs to be open to all people, black and white. He agreed that this course must be integrated. And then two weeks before that integration was supposed to take effect, the clubhouse mysteriously burns down. The clubhouse is gone, but it's just the clubhouse. There's nothing wrong with the rest of the course, but instead of reopening it, the fire marshals go out and condemn the whole course because the clubhouse had been burned down it stayed condemned for seven years. And next, the city goes out and removes all of the topsoil from the first nine holes and builds a garage there. And that's not all. They not only voted to close Gillespie down, they closed NOCO down, they closed all the swimming pools down and everything. 
and uh, they said they were going out of the recreation business rather than integrate. The city council did. By this time, Simpkins and the other men are starting to be called the Greensboro Six, and their case keeps winding its way up to the state Supreme Court, where they lose again, and then the United States Supreme Court agrees to hear the case. Number seven, Leon Wolf, George Simpkins, Jr. and Al, petitioners versus the state of North Carolina. So Simpkins goes looking for a lawyer that would represent them. And we went up to Thurgood Marshall. Thurgood Marshall, the same lawyer who'd won Brown versus Board of Education. Thurgood looked at looked the record, read the record, and he said, he said, your lawyers ought to be the ones to go to jail instead of you. And Marshall says, look, you've already won in federal court. This should be a slam dunk. But somewhere along the line, your lawyers forgot to include that information in an appeal. Marshall tells Simpkins, if I take this case, I'm going to lose on a technicality. So I'm not going to take the case. My father-in-law argued the case for us. Mr. Atkins, you may proceed. Mr. Chief Justice, may it please the court, six Negro appellants who are citizens of Greensboro, North Carolina, have been convicted of the crime of criminal trespass for peacefully playing golf on the public municipal golf course of that city. And the first thing that the Earl Warren, who was the Chief Justice, wanted to know, how could the lawyer, the lawyers leave something so important out of the case? Why were these uh, two exhibits not put in the record? I cannot answer that, Mr. Chief, Mr. Justice Black. And it pretty much goes like Thurgood Marshall predicted. When the decision comes back in 1960, Simpkins and the Greensboro Six lose. Five to four. After that, the governor of North Carolina commuted the men's sentences, so they didn't end up going to jail. But that was it. George Simpkins had lost in the highest court in the land, and the course he tried to integrate was closed. The justice system had failed him. The experience I had in the courtroom where the judge, in the, in the state courts rather, where the judge knew that these people were lying and they were, they were finding us guilty and indicting us on, on, on lies and this type of thing. It, it, it just made me want to just, just devote my life to civil rights. And less than two years after the Supreme Court refused to integrate Gillespie Golf Course, George Simpkins found himself doing the very thing he'd initially set out to do play golf at Gillespie. How he pulled that off and changed the whole city in the process when we come back. This is Away Message. I'm Jeremy Markovich. Just to recap, in 1955, George Simpkins and five other black men were arrested for playing at a whites-only golf course in Greensboro. Their case made it to the United States Supreme Court, and they lost. And while all of that was going on, the clubhouse at the golf course burned down. And rather than integrate, the city closed down all of its recreational facilities, golf courses, swimming pools, and tennis courts. And so to understand what happened next, you have to know a little bit more about George Simpkins. Could be rude if he wanted to. (laughs) This is Henry Fry. For the last, I guess, 15 years or 20 years or something, I've been known as Justice Henry Fry. (laughs) Fry was the first black justice on the North Carolina Supreme Court. But long before that, he was a friend of George Simpkins. And he says Simpkins was really competitive. He hated to lose. And... There was something else. He had the advantage of being independent. He was a dentist. He couldn't be fired for his views because he was his own boss. That had a lot to had a lot to do with it. He couldn't be laid laid off by somebody else. (laughs) There was one more ingredient to all of this. 
Remember, Simpkins had been arrested for playing golf in 1955, but it took five years before the U.S. Supreme Court ruled against him. Five years. And so after that, George Simpkins decided no more waiting. George was was a kind of a guy who, when he saw something he didn't like and thought it was wrong, he was ready to do something about it. And if he had somebody to go with him, fine. If he didn't, he would do it on his own. And he was completely fearless as far as I knew uh, in terms of not worrying too much about what, not only what whites would say, but some blacks. Where do you think that comes from where it's not just people who are white at the time who didn't like what he was doing, but also people who are black didn't like what he was doing? Well, I think the only thing with most of the black folk who didn't like it was they thought that they could do it by negotiating and things of that nature. He was like Abernathy. You ever heard of Abernathy? Abernathy was was, was, uh, Martin Luther King's sidekick lawyer. I guess that's the way I refer to him. Uh, And uh, he said that people have been trying to get me to to say that uh, we're going to do this gradually. He said, if my neck is in the ditch and the man's got his foot on my neck, I don't want him to turn me loose gradually. I want him to turn me loose now. (laughs) And so Simpkins thought, I've waited long enough. If the courts won't help, there is another way. Well, we decided that we needed to get political because at that time we had only 5,500 blacks registered in the city. Simpkins realizes that needs to change. So he starts going around to Greensboro's black colleges and high schools. He tells the president of North Carolina A&T about all of the faculty members who aren't even registered to vote. And he was just amazed. He sat down and it made him mad. He sat down and wrote each one of them a letter. Like that? all of the faculty at a and become registered voters. I went over to Bennett College, we found uh, PhDs teaching political science who were not registered voters. Same thing happens there. I went to Dudley High School. And all of those teachers register to vote. And from there, Simpkins starts going into black neighborhoods. We went from house to house in certain areas and got blacks who were never registered, registered to vote. And steadily, the number of registered black voters in Greensboro more than doubles, from 5,500 to 12,000. And then we started writing letters telling them who the best people to vote for. We made one of the uh, campaign slogan was that, do you intend to open up Gillespie Park so that everybody can play there? Otherwise, we're not going to vote for you. And in the next election, something remarkable happens. We got rid of all the city councilmen who had voted to close down the recreational facility. The new city council decides to reopen Gillespie Golf Course to everyone. And so it opened up uh, as a nine-hole course seven years to the, the, the day after it was closed, December 7, 1955. On that day in 1962, George Simpkins was the first person to tee off. Let's just think about all of this for a second. Simpkins tried to integrate a golf course. He goes to the U.S. Supreme Court and loses. And so then he goes out, gets thousands of black men and women registered to vote, and then changes the complexion of the entire city council. And not only do the golf courses reopen, but the pools and tennis courts reopen as well, for everybody. And he was just getting started. Then the hospitals came along. A patient comes into Simpkins' dentist office, he's got a bad toothache, a fever of 103, and he needs to go to the hospital. Now, the black hospital in Greensboro had no room, so Simpkins checks with the white hospitals. I called Cone, they had room, but wouldn't take him because he was black. I called Wesley Long, they wouldn't take him because he was black, they had room though. And so Simpkins organizes black doctors and dentists and they file a lawsuit and it gets up to the federal appeals court, which rules in his favor. The hospitals have to be integrated. Not only do they have to take black patients, 
but they also have to add black doctors and dentists to their staff. And this ruling is not just for hospitals in Greensboro. Because of George Simpkins, hospitals across the country have to be integrated. If I've done anything, this was probably the most important thing I've ever done in my life because health means so much to everybody. Simpkins kept pushing. He became president of the local NAACP. He integrated Greensboro schools. He changed the way Greensboro City Council was elected to make sure black neighborhoods had representation. He desegregated public housing. He got Martin Luther King to come to town. We had him here to speak, and uh, he was such an orator. Oh, I'm telling you. And here is a crazy piece of trivia. In 1960, a local businessman asked Simpkins if he'd want to lead a sit-in at the White's Only Lunch Counter at the Woolworths in downtown Greensboro. Simpkins, who was still dealing with the golf case at the time, said no. So instead, four freshmen at North Carolina A&T did it instead. The sit-in movement spread like wildfire across the South, leading to even more desegregation. Simpkins would later say that if he'd done it, it wouldn't have taken off like it did. There was, however, one thing that George Simpkins did not do run for office. He had no interest in running any kind of campaign. He truly believed that he could be more influential outside of the system. Jim Melvin, who grew up across the street from Gillespie Golf Course, would go on to become Greensboro's mayor from 1971 to 1981. A lot of politicians uh, are self-serving. He was not personally self-serving. He was uh, trying to positively change the system. But even though he became one of the most powerful political forces in Greensboro, George Simpkins remained, first and foremost, a dentist. And he ran his office out on Bimbo Road. And when I would need to ask him something about the city or so forth, I'd go out unannounced. He'd be in there waiting on a customer. He'd get up and come talk to me. And sometimes that poor soul would be sitting there for 20 minutes with a mouth open. And... Simpkins kept playing golf, kept winning tennis tournaments, and kept seeing patients all the way up until his death in 2001 at age 77. He was our uh, Martin Luther King on a local level. But back at Gillespie Golf Course, it's sort of like George Simpkins is still here. There's a little plaque that tells the story of what he and the Greensboro Six did, but when you talk about him with guys like Jimmy Moore, their eyes light up. What what kind of a golfer was, was Simpkins? He was a good golfer. He was good. Uh, was, was he very serious about it? Serious. Because he bet money. Anytime you're betting your money, you're serious about the game. <laughs> Jimmy Moore loves golf because he grew up working here as a caddy. A lot of other black boys did the same thing. But those same kids could never play golf here until George Simpkins came along. He turned something that was once impossible into something that they could enjoy. And those same kids, those same caddies, have now been coming here to play golf for more than 50 years. But we, we, you know, they opened the golf course back up and all the blacks started playing here and this is what we've been playing ever since. And so when it's Jimmy's turn to play, he gets up to the first tee, pulls out his driver and swings. When he's here, he doesn't have to worry about what's behind him. He can just concentrate on the course ahead.
Away Message is written and edited by me, Jeremy Markovich, and produced by me and James Michkowski. Our digital manager is Kimberly Simpson. Our editor-in-chief is Elizabeth Hudson. Our closing song is His Eye is on the Sparrow by Peter Lamb and the Wolves from Raleigh, featuring Kinston's own Maceo Parker. Additional music by Blue Dot Sessions. Supreme Court audio comes from Oye.com. The interview with George Simpkins comes from the Community Voices Project, which is housed at the Greensboro Public Library. A very special thank you to a lot of people, including Nebraska Douglas, Ralph Miller, Shirley Fry, Gerald Attaway, Bill Hill, Bob Brooks, and the rest of the staff at Gillespie Golf Course. This podcast is a production of Our State Magazine, an employee-owned company that's been celebrating North Carolina for 85 years. If you'd like to have our beautiful magazine delivered to your door every month, head over to OurState.com and use the promo code AWAY to get $5 off a year's subscription. It's our thank you for listening to the show. And one more thing. If a man hits a tree with a golf ball and a podcast reporter is around to hear it, does it make a sound suitable for a ringtone? Can you email that to us? <laughs> Another TD left in the ground. We want to make that his ringtone. <laughs> and next up, a trip to a really, really remote place. A bed and breakfast that sits in the Atlantic Ocean, 32 miles off the North Carolina coast. Let me ask you just like the most basic question I don't think I've asked you yet. I, why did you buy this? You know, I actually I won it in auction, not realizing that I'd win it as the only bidder. We'll have that story for you in a few weeks.